Quote, Major Steed Bonnet, you stand here convicted upon two indictments of piracy. Although you were indicted but for two facts, yet you know that at your trial it was fully proved, even by an unwilling witness, that you piratically took and rifled no less than 13 vessels since you sailed from North Carolina. You know that the crimes you have committed are evil in themselves, and contrary to the law of God by which you are commanded that you should not steal, thieves shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But to theft you have added a greater sin, murder. How many you have killed of those that resisted you in committing your former piracies, I know not. But this we know, that besides the wounded, you killed no less than 18 persons out of those that were sent by lawful authority to suppress you and to put a stop to those rapines that you daily acted. And however you may fancy that was killing men fairly in open fight, yet this no that the power of the sword not being committed into your hands by any lawful authority, you were not empowered to use any force or to fight anyone. And therefore, those persons that fell in that action in doing their duty to their king and country were murdered. And their blood now cries out for vengeance and justice against you. For it is the voice of nature, confirmed by the law of God, that whose sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. And consider that death is not the only punishment due to murderers, for they are threatened to have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Words which carry that terror with them surely must make you tremble for who can dwell with everlasting burnings? You being a gentleman that have had the advantage of a liberal education and being generally esteemed a man of letters, I have just reason to fear that the principles of religion that had been instilled into you by your education have been corrupted. Now that you see that God's hand hath reached you and brought you to public justice, I hope your present unhappy circumstances hath made you furiously reflect upon your past actions and course of life, and that you now find the burden of your sins intolerable. And therefore, having discharged my duty to you as a Christian, I must now do my office as a judge. The sentence that the law hath appointed to pass upon you for your offenses, and which this court doth therefore award, is that you, the said steed bonnet, shall go from hence to the place whence you came, and from thence to the place of execution, where you shall be hanged by the neck till you are dead. And the God of infinite mercy be merciful to your soul. Welcome back, pithy listeners. Today, we are boarding the pirate ship Revenge and heading out to sea. We shall plunder and pillage the life of Steed Bonnet, looking for any buried nuggets of gold or gossip. Fondly known as the Gentleman Pirate, though, as we heard in the highly abridged sentencing by Vice Admiralty Judge Trott, he did not always act the gentleman. Steed had an unusual take on a pirate's life, indeed. Yo-ho, yo-ho, it's a pirate's life for Steed. Wait, Erica, why did the pirate's wife leave him? Um, I I don't know, why? Because he kept saying, yo-ho, and that's just rude. Yo-lady would be much nicer. Yeah, or perhaps yo-gorgeous, yo-fabulous. I would take yo gorgeous. All right. Yo, gorgeous. Are you ready for this? Honestly, you've already completely pirated this episode for your own nefarious plans and puns. I'm out. But you, you, you've met your quota already. Uh, like, how, how but, is it? But every captain needs a first mate, please. Fine. Fine. I guess I'm ready, but... No more pirate jokes, okay? I promise. But 
Can you ever really trust a pirate's word? Oh, Caroline. There is a code of conduct. Honor among thieves. And we're going to talk about it. Thank God. All right. Erica, can you give us a teensy little synopsis of Steed Bonnet's early life? Young Bonnet was born in 1688 to parents Edward and Sarah Bonnet. The family lived on a 400-acre estate just south of Bridgetown, the capital of Barbados. All right, that so far sounds lovely for him. Mm -hmm. Sadly, his father died when Steed was just six years old, leaving the equivalent of a first grader to inherit his vast wealth and properties. So we don't know a ton about his upbringing, though trial records indicate that he had, quote, the advantage of a liberal education, unquote. He was also described by many of his acquaintances as, quote, bookish. At just 17 years old, Steed, like like the horse. Steed? Who, who did this to him? Steed. <laughs> How are we going to address his name? It's a little unique, I guess. <laughs> so, yes, like I mean, the horse. All I could find on the name was that it was not familial, though he does name his son Steed, so he passed this crap on. But anyway. That's a whole choice. That's a choice. It's of early Anglo-Saxon culture, and it means a man of metal or a stud horse. (laughs) Uh, Sadly, I don't think that our gentleman pirate lives up to his lofty name. Yeah. The name is rough. Agreed. Okay, so we have our very wealthy 17-year-old, which I feel like is a repeated theme in this podcast. (laughs) Wealthy 17-year-olds make bad decisions. Bad business. Bad business. 17-year-old Steed married 16-year-old Mary Allenby, who was of the right sort, if you know what I mean. And I do. And they were blessed with three sons, Allenby, Edward, and Steed. And they also had one daughter named Mary. Because these people have absolutely no imagination. I mean, really. Bonnet held the rank of Major in the Barbados Militia, though it seems unlikely that he ever saw any action. Unlikely because it's not recorded or... Well, that, and because his future armed endeavors, let's just say they don't seem like the moves of an experienced soldier. Got it. Got it. Okay. More likely, his rank was due to his large land holdings on which he operated a sugar plantation. At the time, the most essential function of the militia was to deter slave revolts. And yes, his sugar plantation used enslaved labor. And thus, it does make sense that he would have been involved peripherally, at least. So, here he is. Married to the right sort of woman with one heir, two spares, and a daughter. He had all the wealth and status, but for some reason, despite all these advantages in life, Steed wasn't satisfied. Depression, maybe? Perhaps. We'll delve into the why towards the end of the episode, but for now, suffice to say that he just wasn't happy. And so... Manly Steed, Steed the Stud Horse Stallion, turned to piracy. An unusual choice, but okay. And that's what everybody else thought, too. It completely dumbfounded his friends and acquaintances, and frankly, it still baffles historians. But yes, Stallion Steed decides to test his masculine mettle on the high seas. He abandons his family. Oh, and... yeah. So, so manly to abandon your family to the wilds of Barbados. Okay. But nevertheless, he does. He leaves them with the majority of his wealth and all of his land in the spring of 1717. I mean, at least there's that. He hires a local shipyard to build him a brand new 60-ton sloop, or ship, with 10 cannons. And he names it Revenge. Revenge? For what? For what? You own a plantation, for God's (laughs) sakes. You are probably one of the wealthiest men in Barbados. Revenge for what? Well, as I understand it, it was a pretty generic pirate ship name for the time. So perhaps, like we saw with his children's names, he just had no imagination and plucked it from popular pirate lore. He has to have at least some imagination. Bland men just don't say, I'm going to be a pirate today. That's true. That's a very valid point. I'm going to spend this money. I'm going to get me a sloop. I've got 10 cannons. 
maybe he wasn't unimaginative. Maybe he was just basic. <gasps> oh. Like, he got it with his Starbucks and his Ugg boots and walked on uh-huh. board. I like and it. And it's a PSL. It is a PSL. So, in some ways, he would be considered pretty basic because... While he converted to a life of piracy, he decided to take his gentleman's wardrobe with him, complete with powdered wig and fancy hat. I mean, that at least rings of piracy. I mean, think of like Captain Jack Sparrow. I think he'd be pleased. Sure, he wasn't wearing a powdered wig, but he had he had swag. Okay, he did have swag. I think Captain Jack would have liked Captain Bonnet because of the unconventional thinking. I agree. But... While for Captain Jack, that meant ridiculous tricks and devilish deeds. For Steed, it meant commissioning a fancy ship and paying his pirate crew a living wage. A living wage? What? (laughs) That sounds... Slightly different. Nice. (laughs) Doesn't it? Rather than paying on commission like most, or really all other crews at the time, Captain Bonnet paid his men a salary. I mean... He was completely inexperienced in the pirate world. Perhaps no one would sign otherwise, as he honestly had little chance of succeeding and almost no experience. No, not almost no. No, no 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 experience. (laughs) Yeah, I think it's probably that. Or maybe it just never occurred to him to do otherwise. And to be clear, it's not just that he wasn't experienced in the act of piracy. He also was inexperienced in seafaring, as in he had only ever been to sea as a passenger. He had no idea how to sail a ship, much less find another one, chase after it, gun it down, board it with arms drawn, and then pillage. I mean, while it's not exactly a highly intellectual job, Mm -hmm. needing, you know, like a degree or years of study, it does seem that some knowledge of the sailing world would be good. Like, where the directions. Directions? Yeah. You don't get directions as a pirate. You get a treasure map. N- no, you don't get a map. You get a chart. Oh my gosh, you're right. <laughs> so he was unusual for his time, obviously. Most pirates of the day were desperate and only turned to the outlaw life from necessity. The quintessential pirate was usually someone who had escaped a life of enslavement or perhaps an indentured servant. Maybe a colonist who'd failed to earn a living off the land, but guaranteed none of these men started off as the skipper. More likely they were swabbing the decks. Even the way that he got his ship was unusual. Most pirates stole their ships either through mutiny or by forceful boarding and capture of a privateer or military vessel. No one's buying them, much less commissioning them to be built as they wish. That does seem more piratey, but a lot less fun. I agree. <laughs> Sorry, it slipped out. Oh, good Back God. to Stallion Steed. He hired a crew of 70 men and left Carlisle Bay Barbados under the cover of darkness. Just for like dramatic flair? Because at this point, he's just a wealthy gentleman who's <laughs> legally hired a crew, rowdy though they may be, to sail his bought and paid for ship. I think he hoped that no one would realize it was him. He just kind of wanted to disappear and that his former life would never be associated with his new life of piracy. I guess he's thinking about his family and their reputation in that case? Maybe? Let's go with it and just give him the benefit of the doubt? I I think he's just dramatic! Anyone who goes from a wealthy landowner to a pirate is a dramatic person. Well, he's he's bookish. He's probably read a ton of books, and there are books about adventuring pirates and the sailing life and things like that. The romanticized version. Yes, and this is what he wants. I highly doubt he actually wants to pirate. I think he wants... Let's find out, shall we? Yes, shall we? Let's Let's do do it. His first voyage was north to the coast of Virginia, which was still a colony at the time, and relying heavily on his quartermaster and ship's officer, they surprisingly succeeded in raiding not one, but four vessels, one of which was in fact a ship from Barbados, and he burned it. So again, it kind of supports this idea that he didn't want this new life to be discovered back home. And he was pretty serious about this actual pirating thing. He went at it, yeah. But while they hadn't yet fallen flat on their faces, the crew was still 
pretty wary. They, like us, were probably asking themselves what the hell was going on and wondering if their captain was some sort of loon who'd completely lost his grip on reality. I mean, fair, fair. Yeah. But they did continue. They did stay with him. He was paying them no matter what. Yeah, they didn't have to actually catch anything to get paid. So far, he was really just dipping his toes in, testing the waters, and then they headed further north to New York City, where they took two more ships and picked up some essential supplies. They also released some of the captives from their earlier takes in Virginia. How generous. He's a gentleman. Then the crew turned round and headed back for the southern coast again, attacking another two ships on the way, and then set sail for Nassau in the Bahamas, which was an infamous pirate den at the time. Actually, side note. Nassau was literally ruled by pirates from 1706 to 1718, known as the Republic of Pirates. It was a loose confederacy governed by an informal pirate code. I'm so proud I actually knew this. (gasps) Oh, I'm so impressed. I had never heard of this. I thought it was fascinating. And there was a legit pirate code, a governing law and everything. And it included things like democratic votes to determine the ship's leadership and the insistence of pirate crews being treated with civility. La-dee-da. Look at you knowing it all. All right. The Revenge heads for Nassau when it encounters a Spanish man of war, or a really big ship. This encounter does not go well for the pirates. Half the crew are killed or wounded, Bonnet himself is badly hurt, and the ship is barely staying afloat. They do make it to Nassau, floating in on fumes. But they don't have gas. All right, it was just a nice phrase. Okay, go ahead. Floating, how would you say it? Floating in on... Wilted sail. What? Floating in on wilted sail. Wilted Done. sail. <laughs> Done. With with leaks everywhere. It's like half sunk. Imagine Pirates of the Caribbean when Jack Sparrow arrives and yeah, he basically listing. just walks on from the mast because it has completely sunk. There. <laughs> the crew now thinks they're lucky stars that they were in fact headed to the island of pirates where they could find sanctuary to recuperate, replenish, and refit, as well as add some more guns to the ship. Obvi. That is clearly needed. Definitely. And it is there that Steed Bonnet meets Edward Teach. Erica, I, I don't think I need to ask this, but do you know who Edward Teach is? He's Blackbeard. Blackbeard. Born in Bristol, England, Edward Teach, or actually probably not Teach, most pirates actually made up a surname to spare their familial name the shame of association. Huh. Edward, Eddie for short, worked his way up from a deckhand to a captain. With a reputation for being wild and unpredictable, his fearsome appearance and thick black beard earned him his infamous nickname. He was known to be quite tricksy. For example, tying lit fuses under his hat to appear even more menacing, surrounded by smoke and flames. I freaking love that, although it does seem dangerous with all that beard hair flying around. I think the whole lifestyle was pretty dangerous in general, so what's a few scorched hairs? Valid. While Bonnet is recovering, he meets the famous Blackbeard. And in what must be the weirdest decision yet... And that is saying something. Oh, yeah. He cedes command of the revenge to Blackbeard. That he bought. That he bought. He cedes revenge, the ship that he bought, to Blackbeard, as his wounds render him unable to command a ship. But he does join the new captain and the old crew as a guest aboard his own paid-for vessel. So he willingly gave up his ship, the fancy, new, commissioned ship, most likely made to his specifications to one of the most infamous pirates of the day. Yep. Okay, well that's a choice. What a moron, but for the moment it is smooth sailing. Nice one. Supposedly the two were very friendly, and if you believe the HBO series Our Flag Means Death, it was something of a bromance, if not an actual romance. And I have seen this, and I did binge it, and it is good. But it is not accurate, so we're just going to take that out of the equation for the time being. But if you have HBO Max, I highly recommend it. We should definitely make that a small bite, though, for our listeners on Patreon. That is a great idea. we Will do. All right. Bonnet learns from Blackbeard. This was honestly the first time that he'd been aboard a legit pirate ship captained by a real pirate. 
Prior to this, it was more like he was playing dress up. And there is nothing wrong with playing dress up. It makes me think of Marie Antoinette and her miniature Hamlet, a little rustic retreat where she could play farmhouse complete with a working dairy barn and mill. Yeah, little rich boy just needs some adventure, so he buys himself a ship and a crew. But the pirate's life was about to get real. Near Delaware Bay, they plundered 11 ships. And they continued to plunder and loot, doing a fairly good job while giving Bonnet plenty of piracy lessons. Well, he clearly needed those. Yeah, well, I say that. Uh, One captain whose ship was attacked claimed that Bonnet was walking the deck in his nightshirt, apparently still quite unwell from his injuries. Quote, he lacked any command presence. Bless his heart. Especially when compared to daunting Blackbeard. Blackbeard. Sounds a little bit like Blackbeard was pirating and Bonnet was just along for the ride on his own ship that wasn't exactly his anymore in his jammies. In his jammies. It's, I, mm, yeah. I am by no means an expert on pirate code of conduct, but from what I could gather, this is a very unique situation. I could not find any other examples of a pirate ship loan between bloodthirsty thieves. But if someone out there knows better, please do let me know. So Bonnet and Blackbeard, or B-squared, made their way back to the Caribbean, plundering and pillaging as they went. Official records cite that on November 17th of 1717, the 200 ton ship Concord was attacked by two pirate vessels, one of which was almost certainly the Revenge. The Concord crew put up a pretty good fight, but eventually surrendered after it was bombarded on both sides by a volley of cannons and musketry. Blackbeard then took command of the Concord, renaming it Queen Anne's Revenge, and sailed south. Interesting, but why Queen Anne's Revenge? Not sure. Probably to insult King George I, the current monarch of England, who was, to the pirates, seen as the proverbial man. Or maybe it just sounded really good, I don't know. I mean, it does roll off the tongue pretty well. Mm. And ships were often named after women, so that makes sense. Though very rarely were they allowed on ships. No, women were considered very bad luck to pirates. Captains believed their very presence would anger the sea gods, causing terrible weather and perilous conditions. Yeah, it's it's definitely that, and not they would be a distraction. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and therefore there would be fights and jealousy and scheming. No, about. that that couldn't be it. No, mm, no, not that. But back to B squared. Blackbeard now commanded the newly stolen vessel, which left Bonnet with uh, the revenge. Oh, well, goody, goody, he's captain again. For the moment, at least. But betrayal is most certainly on the horizon. Oh, no. Yeah. The two ships split up at some point, and that's when Bonnet encountered a 400-ton merchant vessel. That is twice as big as Blackbeard's new ride, and it is five times as big as his own. So this wannabe pirate tried really hard to capture this enormous vessel, but failed. And this fiasco frustrated the crew. Yes. Uh, They went from a leader like Blackbeard to... (laughs) Stallion Steed. Stallion Steed. I know. I know. The transition of leadership so disappointed the proficient pirates that when they came across Blackbeard just a few days later, they up and deserted Bonnet, joining Blackbeard's crew instead. Ooh, that's cold. Yeah. But what about the salaries? Haven't they heard they're saying, bird in the hand, it's worth two in the bush? (laughs) I can't remark on the proverb's popularity, but I think they knew the saying, better alive than dead. While perhaps more financially secure, Bonnet was more physically dangerous to the men. The man was running before he even really had his sea legs, but despite it being obvious to us that he was a total disaster, Bonnet himself was <gasps> shocked by their betrayal and even more surprised that Blackbeard just took his ship and handed the leadership over to his own second in command, inviting Bonnet, his former friend slash co-captain, to be his guest. What a terrible end to bromance. That's against the bro code. Dude, I feel this like. bromance is not finished. <gasps> just... Wait. Is it going to get sloppy? It's going to get sloppy. But it oh, was no. at this point that Bonnet started to rethink his piracy plans. 
at this point, at this point, at this not point. when he's severely injured, not when his ship was co-captained by someone else, not when he failed to capture the merchant ship. Now. Now. Right now. Or at least so say the records. Mm. He evidently confided to a few of his loyal crew members that he was kind of ready to give up the whole criminal world for a life of relaxed exile in Spain or Portugal. Why didn't he just go back to his family? He just... He can't go back to his family because he was a pirate, so he would be hanged. But, yeah, why he didn't... I. You ask these hard questions, I don't know, but he's ready to give it up. However, vacation was definitely not in the cards. Now Commodore Blackbeard, commanding two ships, mm-hmm. he took advantage of this momentum and captured another and then another, giving him now four ships with which to wreak havoc. And he used this squadron to blockade the port of Charlestown, which is now known as Charleston. So Blackbeard, after pissing off the South Carolinian authorities, headed to Topsail Island for a little R&R, meaning resupply and refitting, only for his flagship, Queen Anne's Revenge, to run aground. Oh dear. Mm. Stuck there, Blackbeard and Bonnet made yet another very weird decision. A recurring theme, it seems. Mm -hmm. They decided to travel together, like they're friends again, to Bath, the capital of North Carolina at the time, to petition Governor Charles Eden for pardons under King George's Acts of Grace. All right, what are the Acts of Grace? I don't know this one. Well, officially, it's the Proclamation for Suppressing Pirates. Issued by George I of Great Britain in September of 1717, the nicknamed Act of Grace promised royal pardons for all acts of piracy to any pirate who surrendered themselves to authorities before a very specific deadline the following summer. It also included bounties for pirates who failed to surrender before the deadline, which encouraged pirate crews to capture their own captains for rich rewards. So, be squared. Were they actually tempted by this, or were they trying to, like, was there a scheme afoot? Was there a scheme afoot? I'm not sure. Maybe? They had a very short amount of time before the deadline was up, so maybe they honestly thought this was the best choice? What what was George doing? Was he just tired of hanging pirates, or did he have the Spanish to annoy? He definitely had the Spanish to annoy, and there were a lot of swinging bodies, but I think that he was trying to change, as you say, the direction of piracy. Originally, like we saw in the Lost Colony episode, piracy was really more like privateering and was encouraged by the British, but only when attacking Spanish ships. Mm. The British government was happy to hear of Spanish merchants losing their profits, or even better, the Spanish government losing their hard-earned, and by that I mean brutally stolen, plunder. But at some point, the pirates' eyesight started to deteriorate. Thus the eye patches. Obviously, yes. In fact, it became so bad that they had a lot of trouble differentiating between the Spanish flag and the British flag. You know, it's tricky. What with having only one color in common and very different markings, I could see how the mistake could be made. Yeah, it's a really sad problem for the pirate. I mean, after all, what do you call a pirate with two arms, two legs, and two eyes? Fine. Tell me more. A rookie. I mean, accurate. I I can't say that you're wrong. They lost a lot of opinions. You're not wrong. (laughs) You're not wrong. I think that's the last one. No, it's not. No, it's not. (laughs) All right, back to the action, or really, honestly, lack thereof. B-squared make their way to the governor, and they officially renounce piracy forever. Mm, This is, seems like a turning point. Does it? (sighs) So afterwards, Blackbeard is like, I promise, never again. And then he immediately returns to Topsail Island. But Bonnet, because he was a citizen of Barbados, had to stay a little bit longer to confirm the documents that he needs to obtain in order to convert from pirate to privateer. My lord, I didn't realize it was a whole religious conversion. They had to have the documents. You know, it's all about that piece of paper. Yeah, with the, the stamp. paperwork. You have to have the, the paper. paper with the stamp and the wax and yeah. So a few days later, Steed follows Eddie back to Topsail only to discover, you got a guess? <sighs> Has he taken his ship? Has he not actually stopped being a pirate? And I, I, I feel like there's betrayal coming. 
Definitely betrayal, pretty much all of the above. So Blackbeard had absolutely double-crossed his former co-captain slash prisoner slash friend slash enemy. It's a complicated relationship, and I'm just very upset by this. Our poor little steed, he never learns. He is honestly just too trusting. I mean, as you said in the beginning, can you ever really trust a pirate? I certainly wouldn't. No, not after this tale of betrayal. Part of me really just still wants to believe Steed is a gentleman at heart and this idea of a gentleman's word of honor, but he's not dealing with other gentlemen. He's dealing with a pirate. It's literally in the job description. Lie, cheat, steal. Yes, I agree. I know that you want to give this very Southern gentleman the benefit of the doubt, but yeah, if he really believed that, then he's just an idiot. Blackbeard was gone, and he had sailed away to an unknown destination on one of the two newer ships that he'd captured called the Adventure. He had also robbed the Revenge, the Queen Anne's Revenge, and the other ship that I don't have the name of, and taken all of their valuables and necessities, and then marooned the majority of the crew, because it was a crew to fit four ships, and now he's only got one, and left them basically for dead. None of that makes sense. Why not? Why would you want to not have more ships? Oh, well, the Queen Anne's Revenge had run aground, so it was out. Yeah. I don't know about the rest. Maybe, maybe the bromance was still, like, a teensy bit alive, and he left him a ship so that he could go somewhere? Mm -hmm. No? Okay. Well, now we have Bonnet trying to salvage this situation, and most historians believe that he did intend, at this moment, to keep his word and return to the right side of the law. But he was left with little choice because once he resumed command of the revenge, taking any of the crew that he could find, including the ones left for dead by Blackbeard, his first goal was not to go straight. It was revenge. Well, at least the name makes sense now. Better late than never, I suppose. Maybe he was just like clairvoyant or something. Doubtful. Or he most definitely would have made some different life choices. Mm, Yeah, that's true. Okay, so probably just a sad coincidence then. The double-crossed bonnet set sail to hunt down Blackbeard. Did he find him? Absolutely not. First off, Blackbeard was a real pirate, while Bonnet was, well, playing dress-up. And second, he had no clue where he'd gone. Talk about a needle in a haystack. No, the two men, and I'm sorry to say this, they never met again. And thus, B-squared was nevermore. Quoth the raven. So after naively scanning the seas for his nemesis, Bonnet decided to tackle the real issues and head to St. Thomas, where he could obtain his official seal of privateer. But he had two problems. Just two. Okay, he had innumerable problems, but two that I'm going to address right now. Number one, Blackbeard had stolen all the supplies, including the food. In fact, at his trial, Bonnet testifies that they were down to under 10 barrels of essentials, which, based on the way he said it, sounds really bad. And two, it was hurricane season in the Atlantic. And for folks like myself who grew up with Hurricane Watch, glued to the TV every fall, awaiting imminent danger and school closings due to power outages, obviously one being much more dire than the other, we know that hurricanes are no joke it would be very risky to head south to St. Thomas at this time of year. And so he was left with no other choice. Back to piracy he goes. He had to feed his crew and bide his time. But hoping to eventually cash in on his act of grace, he decides to change his name and that of the ship. And so let me introduce Captain Thomas of the Royal James. Am I hearing some Jacobite sympathies there? I thought you would pick up on that. Yeah, most likely. He was said to raise a glass to the old pretender. So a little Outlander reference for all of our listeners. You're welcome. But all this aside, he decided to lean into his gentlemanly ways. He used his posh bearing and educated manner to convince other ships that he was on the up and up. On the pretense of trade, he would engage other vessels only to turn pirate and rob them. Honestly, this is the point in his career that he actually becomes a pirate. At first, he was kind of just along for the ride, just the money man, and then he was a bit of a captive on his own ship. But now, he is calling the shots. He is actually pirating. Ghosty! Are we encouraging this? Should we praise his newfound (laughs) piracy prowess? 
It's up to you. It's going to end up the same no matter what happens. Oh, truly a pirate's fate for Steve. Indeed. And after this worked so well, he decided that maybe the pirate's life really was for him. And so he just fully reverted back. And not a pretense this time, for real. I can't I can't no. keep track of his flippin' floppin'. He is flippin' and floppin'. But for real, he gave up the farce and declared himself once more to be a pirate. He worked tirelessly, pillaging 11 vessels in a very short period of time, taking some prisoners, and actually converting a few to the life of piracy. Clearly his story was an aspirational one. I, I suppose, yeah. And to signify his true conversion... Bonnet also stopped his unorthodox practice of paying his crew, instead dividing the loot amongst his men. Whoa, whoa, really going full pirate. All he was missing was the peg leg and hook. All right, Caroline, in honor of my pirate-loving husband, who literally owns a skull and crossbones bow tie and had a matching belt until it got <clears throat> lost during a move, I've got one for you. <laughs> you ready? Yes. Where? Does a pirate purchase his hook? The Navy Exchange? No. At the second hand shop, silly. Okay. okay. <laughs> and now, circle us back to Steed. All right. At this point, the Royal James, previously known as the Revenge, was in rough shape. To repair his ship, Bonnet captured a small boat, broke it apart, and repaired his ship with those pieces, using the captured boat's crew as enforced labor, even threatening to maroon them if they refused to participate. Getting into the lifestyle. Yeah, very piratey. He's really going at it. Whole hog, I believe is the phrase, yeah. Yeah. But it's too little too late, for the winds of change were coming. Or actually, more like the tides of change. Because it was the tides that would finally end Steed Bonnet's reign of piracy. That's pretty ironically appropriate, considering his lack of seafaring knowledge. Mm -hmm, I thought so too. So the authorities were now fully aware that Bonnet had forsaken his whole act of grace facade, and that he was back to his old ways. The governor of South Carolina sent an expedition to capture the Dread Pirate Bonnet. I think you mean the Dread Pirate Roberts. Okay, fine. So, um, what about the mildly intimidating Pirate Bonnet? Better. William Rett led a squadron of 130 militiamen to take down Steed, but Bonnet, not being so good at all this stuff quite yet, mistook them for merchants and actually sent out three canoes to capture them. Whoops! <laughs> But luck was on his side for the moment. Rhett's flagship Henry ran aground, and so while Bonnet's men approached with ill intent, they did have time to realize their mistake and quickly hightail it back to the mildly intimidating pirate Bonnet and inform him of their little oopsie-daisy. Wow, that's a really, really obscure pirate term. I'm glad you brought that up. Oopsie-daisy. You know, this is a very well-researched podcast. What, what can I say? Oopsie-daisy. <laughs> <laughs> Bonnet was left with little choice. He decided to fight his way out to sea. He also decided to write a very threatening letter to Governor Johnson of South Carolina, claiming that he would burn every single ship in Charleston Harbor. Oh, that's, uh, that's maybe not a great choice there, Steve. Remember, he's dramatic. <laughs> and all grown up threatening the establishment, but mm, yes. maybe, maybe not. Maybe not. To prove that he was true to his word, Bonnet actually initiated the encounter, which came to be known as the Battle of Cape Fear River. Oh my god, an official battle? Did he see action? Yes, he did. And as soon as it began, he ran aground. Oh. But the good news is the South Carolina militia also immediately ran aground. My god, why are they all so lame? I don't know. But they actually did end up with something like a six-hour stalemate, as everyone involved was just stuck. And they did lob some musket volley back and forth, and, and in fact were able to kill ten of Rhett's crew and twelve of Bonnet's. But, yeah. Bonnet's crew is said to have fought enthusiastically. And by that, I mean that yelling across the ocean, they dared their opponents to jump in, swim over, climb aboard, and fight hand-to-hand -hand like a man. I double-dog dare you. I bet you won't. Yeah. You won't come over here. You don't Pretty have what it takes. the dumbest double-dog dare. Like, who would ever take him up on that? But at least they were getting into character. And Bonnet himself 
also got into character. It is said that he patrolled the deck, pistol drawn, threatening death to any pirate who refused to fight. And evidently some actually did because some of the crew were really the prisoners that Bonnet had conscripted into piracy and they did not want to fight the government. Well, that is a damned if you do, damned if you don't situation. Mm -hmm. Either be killed for refusing to fight or risk hanging for piracy by fighting the government. Fortunately for the prisoners, the battle did pick up and became chaotic enough to distract Steed from his newfound courage. And a few of his conscripted conscientious objectors narrowly escaped their threatened fate. In the end, the battle was decided by the tides, which appropriately enough were not in Bonnet's favor. The militia ships floated free first, leaving Royal James a literal sitting duck. Bonnet could feel the noose tightening and told his gunner to blow up their powder magazine as a last-ditch effort, but the gunner did not. And, and why not? Well, it seems that some of the other crew members overruled him because they, they didn't want to be blown up. Better to hang than to blow up, or they hope for an escape. I really hope it's the former, because the crew was surrounded by the militia, and all the pirates were taken prisoner and returned to Charleston for sentencing and execution. Once on dry land, Bonnet and his sailing master were actually jailed separately from the rest of the crew. And after being there for about three weeks, they actually managed to escape with the help of a local merchant. Makes sense. The crew is stuck with their fate, but the wealthy landowner manages to bribe his way out. As they say, money talks. I, I get it. Okay. Indeed it does. Which is why the South Carolina governor, Johnson, then placed a 700 pound bounty on Bonnet's head. And that is no small amount for the time. Wow. So Bonnet and his sailing master fled and were somehow joined by an indigenous American and an enslaved man. Like, how does that happen? I have no clue. I tried to find out. I couldn't find anything that detailed how exactly they got added to the gang. Maybe they were fellow prisoners at the same time, or maybe the merchant hooked them up. I, if someone knows, please do let us know. But however it happened, it would not end well for the other men. Uh, it never does when you have a gentleman pretending to be a pirate in charge. Like, I wanted better from you, Steed. Come on, Steed. So the four of them found or were given or maybe stole, probably stole, they're pirates, stole a boat and tried to sail away. But the winds... Ah, uh, the winds of change. They are coming. Only in the wrong direction. They actually pushed Steed and his miniature crew toward Sullivan's Island, which is a small island at the entrance of Charleston Harbor. And that- and where I kissed my husband for the first time. <gasps> got some good goss. Now you know. Being stuck on this small island where Erica had a wonderfully passionate moment with her future husband, this gave the determined Rhett and his men yet another opportunity to catch this guy. I gotta say, I might send somebody else after them. Rhett seems unable to keep hold of the slippery buggers or, you know, his own ship from being run, run aground. aground. Yeah. Rhett does not seem to be much more capable than Steed, I must agree. But I'm sure it was a point of pride at this point. Bonnet and his little crew were hunted down once more and the conflict escalated. The militia opened fire, killing the sailing master and injuring the enslaved man and the indigenous American man. And now cuffed and returned to Charleston again, Steve Bonnet would face trial. All right, lay it on me. You know I love to give out judgments. I know you do. The money trail alone pretty much speaks for itself. He bought the boat, he hired the crew, he looted and pillaged, he split the booty. Oh, and then he bribed someone to escape from jail. So it's all right there. Seems pretty open and shut to me. Well, let's see if Sir Nicholas Trott, Vice Admiralty Judge, agrees with you. On the 10th of November, 1718, Bonnet stood to answer two formal counts of piracy. Two? <laughs> Only two? I know, that was my question. I am not sure if they felt that, frankly, no more than two were necessary. <laughs> or if that's the only evidence they could find, but the commanders of the Francis and the Fortune, which were both ships that Bonnet and his crew had raided, were present to act as witnesses. Clearly Blackbeard didn't do a very good job of teaching him never to leave witnesses. Missed that little nugget. So Bonnet, interestingly, amongst his many wonderful decisions, decided to represent himself. But it's on brand. You're right, it is on brand. As terrible of an idea as it is, he pled not guilty. Bonnet claimed that his crew had turned pirate against his will. 
He reminded the court of his complete lack of sailing experience. And he drove home this account asking, what true pirate captain would voluntarily give up their ship to the command of another, especially Blackbeard? No, he argued, he was just an innocent gentleman whose crew overwhelmed him, took him prisoner, and went rogue. I mean, not a terrible defense. It's not. I actually was like, you know, that's kind of valid. It frankly makes more sense than the yes. actual story. Yes, it does. <laughs> This is where he lost me, though. He goes on to claim that he was sound asleep during the capture of the Francis, one of the two ships that was represented at the trial. I mean... <laughs> asleep? <laughs> now, like, asleep at sea, I can see that. Asleep at night or a nap, but not when there is an armed encounter going on. I just... Cannons, muskets. Even just swords clanking? Yeah. Like, no. You can sleep through the swords clanking, but not the cannon. Not, not the, the cannon. cannon. No. So, I don't know. I, I can't figure out how this happened. But the crew, having already been sentenced to hang themselves, was all too happy to take Bonnet down with them. They adamantly testified that he was, in fact, a pirate and the leader of their crew. Although they were pretty embarrassed about the fact that they belonged to his crew. And they made it quite clear that they did not respect him as a pirate. But still, he was nominally in charge. Yes, being a bad pirate isn't exactly the same as not being a pirate. And the judge agreed. He delivered a verdict of guilty, sentencing the gentleman pirate to death by hanging. But not before giving him a very stern lecture on how his vile actions violated his most sacred Christian duties. Oh, burn! Yeah, I mean, at this point, can you really tell a pirate that they're an evil person? They already know, come on. So, like every good court battle, there was an appeal. Bonnet wrote to Governor Johnson asking for clemency. Uh, is this, this, this is the same Johnson, Governor Johnson, that he sent that super hostile letter being like, I'm gonna burn every ship in the harbor. You don't know me. The very same. Mm. Sweet. Nice. I mean, sometimes decisions just aren't really steeds. They're not his strong suit, man. No, he he's not doing well. Yeah, that was a weird choice to begin with, and it really cost him in the end. Because of the appeals, he did manage to buy himself some time. The governor actually delayed his execution seven times due to protests. Many of the colonists, women in particular, publicly objected to his sentencing. Was he that handsome? Well, let me show you a picture real quick. Take a look at him, see what you think. Would that make you protest? Um, hard no. Hard no. Hard pass. <laughs> I think part of it is the fancy wig. It is very distracting for the modern it, viewer, but... I don't know. He uh -uh. just looks like he has overly protruding features. Yes, he does look a bit, um, hawkish maybe? He clearly has some bluey green eyes. I bet that was nice. He does seem well dressed. True. And let's be honest, sometimes you can be ugly as sin and have a great personality and it make up for it. Yeah, but no. I think that beyond but being handsome- Riot? Protest? No. Mm -mm -mm. According to nope. historian Colin Woodward's The Republic of Pirates, Quote, ordinary people were upset about the growing gap between rich and poor and the growing authoritarian power of the British Empire, unquote. And if this sounds familiar, Americans, it should. Therefore, many colonists viewed pirates as contemporary Robin Hood type figures and supported their efforts to stick it to the man. But Steed Bonnet would end his piracy days in the typical manner, death by hanging. He was executed at White Point Gardens in Charleston on the 10th of December, 1718. I think I had a friend get married there. <laughs> oh, you might have. There's a lovely plaque as well. It's supposed to be lovely. <laughs> at least he went out with a view. <laughs> I like that. I like that. Uh, it does not seem necessarily like he should have given up his previous life for this life of crime and piracy. No, weird choices. Weird and choices. so when did he... When did he give it up? When did he start being a pirate? Sometime in the spring of 1717. Oh, that is not fun math. No, no. Less than two years total. Wow. Okay. Mm -hmm. That is a blip. 
Mm-hmm. That poor woman. She doesn't yeah. even have time to get over the fact that her husband has left her before he is dead. Yeah, and very publicly. Yeah, yeah like, and his it's... professional life as a pirate was just such a blip. To quote Bonnet's pirate contemporary, Captain Bartholomew Roberts, a merry life and a short one shall be my motto. Well, I hope it was worth it. Historically, it it actually was quite helpful. That is something. Bonnet's trial records are considered one of the most valuable historical records we have on piracy and especially on Blackbeard, who, I must tell you, actually met his own bloody end a month before Bonnet in a skirmish with the Royal Navy. And as proof, his head was severed and given to the authorities for identification. That's gruesome, but at least Steed made it out after him. Steed eked out past Blackbeard. Yes, good good for you, Bonnet. Good for you. Clearly, piracy was a dangerous profession, and as Captain Roberts said, short and sweet, which leads me back to the very beginning. Why? Why on earth would a wealthy gentleman with every advantage in life give it all up to be shot at, live on a stinking boat with what I can only assume is horrendous hygiene, surrounded by menacing, icky men who didn't respect him, didn't want to listen to him, all with the knowledge that he'd likely swing? Why? I don't get it. It's It's the million dollar question. From what I could find, though, there are... Four probable possibilities. Hit me with it. One, financial. David Moore, an archaeologist and historian with the North Carolina Maritime Museum, points to legal documents that suggest Bonnet borrowed 1,700 pounds, or $400,000 today, in 1717. It's about when he turned pirate, so could that have been for the ship? Well, no, it's not. But it is possible that he was not in as secure a financial position as we originally thought. Based on contemporary sources of the time, there is a very good possibility that a hurricane or some other natural disaster had destroyed his sugar crop for the year and left him in dire straits. So what, he just decided to take what was left, build a boat, and abandon his wife and four kids? Fabulous. Yeah, I don't think there's any defending him against that. Number two, political. As you pointed out, the ship's second name, Royal James, is thought to be a reference to James Stuart, the true King of England, over the German-born George I. It could be that he went rogue to stick it to the man, King George. As Woodward points out, quote, Most pirates at the time thought of themselves as in revolt against King George. There was a lot of toasting to King James III, unquote. Yeah, sure, but that does seem like a pretty big leap to take. Mm -hmm. It would not be my choice, but maybe I'm just not as dedicated to my political beliefs. Maybe Revenge, the original name, seemed pretty generic, but was actually a reference to Avenging James Stewart. I like that. It certainly feels better than just a random, a random pick, yeah. Number three, personal. He likely didn't have a happy, loving marriage. But that's like everybody in this era. But maybe his was worse than usual? I I mean, we're, we're clutching at straws here. Charles Johnson, in his A General History of the Pirates, claims Bonnet was driven to piracy by his wife's nagging and the, quote, discomforts he found in a married state. I got some discomforts for him. Another theory is still personal, but it's that the death of one of his children left him so distraught. Woodward explains, quote, Bonnet may have been unbalanced. From the genealogical record, we know that there had been disruptions in his life, One of his children had recently died. Trying to cope somehow. Piracy wouldn't be my first drastic decision, but I could see where he was just losing it or something. So this all leads to the fourth option, which was a mental break. Perhaps he he just went mad. Perhaps he was driven insane. Perhaps his brain decided to cope with the pressures and despair by losing touch with reality. I, I don't know. I think it's probably all all four. That's what I think. I think it's a combo of the first three and it led to the fourth. All but... in all, I think you're missing the fifth possibility. Mm, which, which one? The call of adventure, the thrill of the fight, excitement and drama. Right? Do you think he's quite dramatic? That's true. So maybe, but 
I would think he'd have quickly realized that that romanticized version of piracy we talked about that he held in his mind from stories was a pretty far cry from the harsh reality of life at sea. Wouldn't he just be like, oh, okay, tried it, bye. But by then it was too late. He was hooked. And that, my friends, is that. We hope you've enjoyed our punerific episode on Steed Bonnet, the Gentleman Pirate. Please let us know if you're enjoying the podcast with a review or a rating. Every little click, bump, and like helps us tremendously. Till next week, I'm Caroline. And I'm Erica. And we are Pithily Yours. This episode is brought to you by the Pithy Chronicle, LLC. The Pithy Chronicle is intended for education, entertainment, and non-commercial purposes. Any views or opinions expressed in this podcast are personal and do not represent those of people, institutions, or organizations that the owner may or may not be associated with in a professional or personal capacity. While we offer lots of sarcasm, this podcast does not offer any advice or services. Listening to this podcast may induce fits of laughter, unexpected distraction, or uncontrollable rage at the subjects. Hopefully not at us. We hope you learned something today. If not, so sorry. Please be advised we are not experts in the following fields. Medical, legal, financial, technological, thermonuclear engineering, submarine warfare, neuroscience, or cat husbandry. Thanks for listening to our little disclaimer. Just covering our history-loving asses. Bye!